the opportunity to talk about the APRP, its objective of Pan-Africanism, One Unified Socialist Africa. And if you want to understand more about that, the pictures on the right, the party was founded in 1968 by Kwame Nkrumah. And he wrote the book, The Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. And that book lays out the strategy for achieving revolutionary Pan-Africanism, which is to unite all of the forces on the ground. So the logos you see there, PAC of Zania, the PAIGC of Guinea-Bissau, the PDG of Guinea, Azapo of Azania, the ACIS of Nigeria, the Zimbabwe movement of Pan-African socialists in Zimbabwe, just, just examples of organizations who agree that one unified socialist Africa, as Nkrumah said, is the solution to the problems African people face everywhere on earth. And until Africa is free, no African anywhere will be free. So our work is fusing with all of these political formations and others to create this worldwide force, the All African Committee for Political Coordination, the All African uh, People's Revolutionary Army, the All African People's Revolutionary Party that Nkrumah talks about in the handbook. So we're happy to be here to continue that struggle. We have chapters all over the world, as we mentioned, and relationships with other liberation movements who are fighting against the same enemy we are, international capitalism and imperialism. So we thank you again for joining us today. We're so happy to have you here with us. And to get us started, as always, um, we have a little different format. Since we're talking about patriarchy today, um, Shakura is going to um, do uh, a lot of the presentation, and I'll make my humble contributions as well. But as we always do, we will start by me turning it over to her. Good evening, everyone. I hope that you are maintaining your mental health, self-care however you can. I just want to give a disclaimer and let everyone know that this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. So there is going to be some passion. You might even hear me get revved up, amped up a little bit. So hopefully that doesn't scare anyone. But I personally think a little passion is always a good thing because it reminds us what we are working towards and why we need to stay focused. So without further ado, we start with the basic definitions around the topic for today. By patriarchy, we mean the systemic oppression of women identifying people for the purpose of male domination and the control of women identifying people's existence, their bodies, their minds, and their existence. Patriarchy is an institutional system that has been dominantly in place for at least the last 10,000 years. Its origins are consistent with the rise of slavery as the dominant economic system in the world. When we say slavery, we are not talking about the transatlantic slave trade that is responsible for the overwhelmingly majority of Africans who exist today in the Western Hemisphere. We mean the economic system of slavery that replaced communalism as a dominant economic system. The creation of class stratification where people begin to recognize that you could physically dominate people and force them to work for you, thus creating class divisions and one class of people creating a wealth for a higher class of people. It was during this period that men began to initially dominate women and all of the institutions of society were organized to aid in this oppression of women identifying people. Education, religion, etc., were all organized to perpetuate the myth that men are stronger and therefore should be in control of society. This was done to perpetuate the oppression of women identifying people. We say identifying because despite what many would have you believe, Africa's history is a diverse history where various types of relationships between human beings and various genders, not just men and women, clearly existed in harmony with one another historically. There is ample evidence of this in the Yoruba, Fonti, 
etc. ethnic groupings in African history. The purpose and role of patriarchy was to establish and maintain a system of male domination over women identifying persons for the objective of profiting from this exploitation and being able to control women identifying persons as a means of controlling all of society. Today, patriarchy continues to be an oppressive instrument against women identifying people. In fact, the ability of sexual assault, abuse, trafficking, and general exploitation of women identifying people is the direct result of institutionalized patriarchy, which commodifies women identifying people, thus justifying this oppression on a systemic basis. For example, trans African women, clearly the human beings who benefit the absolute least from capitalism's hierarchical structure can be systemically murdered with barely a sound coming in protest from anywhere outside of that community. Why, you ask? Because patriarchy as a key appendage to capitalism devalues these women identifying people, eliminating their humanity. And all the institutions in this society operate to perpetuate that oppression. Religion, all of them, as practice devalue these humans' lives. Institutions like social services and police dismiss and devalue these lives. And the capitalist media, the mouthpiece for this system, devalues these lives. This is true for trans women as well as women in Africa suffering under polygamy. And because of the miseducation that justifies patriarchal oppression, men and women identifying people influenced by men because the values of men dominate this society can openly claim patriarchy without fear or consequences. Thus, the system continues to operate on subtle and consistent levels, continuing to make life difficult for the overwhelming majority of women identifying people on this earth. Next slide, please. Lots of patriarchal supporters try to justify patriarchy by attempting to diminish monarchy. Since patriarchy as we defined it is a systemic oppression of women identifying people, a lot of people attempt to claim that matriarchy is simply the opposite where women dominate men. My apologies, I said monarchy earlier, but I meant to say matriarchy. Clearly there is absolutely no evidence of this, this idea of matriarchy being a systemic oppression of women identifying over dominating men. So there's no evidence of this. Information about matriarchy being practiced in the world is very difficult to find, but what we know, which is irrefutable, is that matriarchy is the opposite, isn't the opposite of patriarchy. Instead, matriarchy is a system where women identifying people are able to participate and reach their full potential as human beings without the oppression of patriarchy holding them down. There is absolutely no evidence that men who existed under a matriarchal periods of history experienced any oppression because they were men or any systemic obstacles accordingly. Ya Asantiwa was a woman from the Ashanti region of Ghana. She and her husband, Primpe, were captured by the colonizing British and deported in 1896. Ya Asantiwa disregarded the fear expressed by the Ashanti men and called for all Ashantis to mobilize to fight the British. Over 4,000 Ashantis responded to her call to action and the war of the golden stool took place in the 1900s, which was one of the most devastating anti-colonial wars carried out in Africa's history. Led by this woman, 
Ya Asantiwa, the Ashantis experienced significant military victories against the British, but class struggles often overlooked by race conscious Africans created divisions between the Ashantis, Fontis, and Ga peoples, which the British were able to exploit to maintain colonial power in Ghana for another almost 60 years. Still, what's critical to note is during that period of time that Ya Asantiwa's leadership existed among the Ashanti people, a period of almost 20 years, there was no examples of men being subjugated or disenfranchised. Only examples of obstacles placed before women being removed to permit them to reach their full potential regardless of gender. No scholars can produce evidence of any systemic oppression of men under this period in the Ashanti land. In Angola, during Nzinga's decades long leadership, or in any areas of Africa or anywhere else where the matriarchy existed for brief periods compared to the centuries long dominance and oppression of patriarchy. Thank you. Thank you, Shakura. And so first just want to say, as you probably hear, we have birds here in my house and the birds are extreme, are very anti-capitalist, anti-white supremacy, anti-patriarchy, anti-homophobia. So when we talk about these subjects, they have a lot they have to say. I don't think that they feel like we adequately address the issues. And if I was them, I would feel the exact same way. So um, just have to apologize for that and just have that in the background. And then I also just wanted to um, reiterate, reiterate something Shakur said. Um, the Golden Stool Wars in Ghana, which were led by uh, Sister Ya Santiwa, you know, this is just one of many examples. Like, we can just talk about Ghana. I mean, we can talk about Senegal, Guinea, Mali. We can talk about the Congo, Rwanda, Burundi. We can talk about Azania, which you call South Africa. We can talk about Kenya, Tanzania. But just talking about Ghana as an example, you can talk about the Golden Stool Wars against the British. We can talk about the Lobodi people in the Accra region of Ghana and their relentless fight against British colonialism and imperialism. And this is important for those people that say, well, the people in Africa never fought for us. Like, read a book, be quiet, and do study on your history. Know your history. There are examples everywhere. There's information everywhere. So if people don't know, and they're talking about all this stuff that's not true, it's, that's, that's because you don't wanna know. So we gotta learn our history. And on that note, when we talk about the role of men, the first thing is Shakura talked of women identifying people. And just wanted to say the reason why we use that term is that we recognize and respect the fact that humanity comes in many different forms. And the African masses come in many different forms. And whether you want to accept it or not, or whether you see it or not, there are significant numbers of African people who do not identify with the two gender uh, binary that's been imposed upon us. And because they don't identify with that, we say women identifying to respect them and respect that. We don't feel like it takes anything from us as a, as a man, as what you would call a heterosexual man, whatever way you wanna describe it, me. Um, I don't see why acknowledging that or how acknowledging that um, makes me lose anything, not even an inch. So we acknowledge that because unity means coming together with people in ways that you wouldn't normally do. If, if, you, if you are only doing everything you would normally do and not extending yourself beyond what's comfortable for you, that's not how you achieve unity. Unity is all about uniting with people who, who do not come from the same perspective you do. So we're serious revolutionary organizers. So we embrace all African people. We wanna organize every African on earth. So that's why we use that term in case you didn't know. And that goes straight into the role of men 
in patriarchal oppression. So, you know, I think as men, patriarchy as a system of oppression is devastating for us as well. Because what patriarchy teaches us is that we have to always maintain this facade of machismo, which means that we can never ever uh, display any emotion. We can never uh, be complete human beings. We have to be this image of the strong silent type and that's not attainable. That's not tenable, that's not realistic. And so this is the reason why men struggle so much to function in healthy psychological and spiritual ways because to express pain, to be in the moment, these are things that are detrimental to you as a man. And I, and I say this because even today among a lot of people who consider themselves politically progressive, because I'm a man that I grew up through a very patriarchal model. My father, loved my father to death, but he was as patriarchal as they came. And, and what he told me for as long as I could speak was, don't ever make any excuses, boy. I don't wanna hear you making excuses. No matter what kind of physical, mental or spiritual pain I was under, his message to me every day was just deal with it. And so I acknowledge, like that's how I grew up. When there was pain, I just dealt with it. When there were issues, I just dealt with that. I didn't complain. And I still don't, I still struggle with that. And I've done a lot of work to combat that. And as a result, I've come to a point now where I'm very comfortable with my emotions. I'm comfortable with crying when I need to. And if that's uncomfortable for you, that's your problem. But this is the healthy way to live. It's much healthier than how I used to live when I was younger. But also what I found is that even though even progress, so-called progressive minded people say this is what they want in men, when I exhibit that behavior, I don't see anybody that's comfortable with it. So this is something that has to be addressed because if we want men to be better, we have to support the effort to challenge patriarchy. You know, we can't say, yeah, we want you to do this, but we're still gonna maintain all the tenets of patriarchy and you have to abide by them. And while you're abiding by them, you have to somehow figure out how to be against them. Like that's, you know, we have to support that. So I'm saying like, when you have men who are exhibiting these anti-patriarchal characteristics of being humanistic, then, you know, try to do whatever we can do to create that kind of environment where that's okay. Because that to me is what true strength for men is, is acknowledging that I can be in this world, I can be in this world with women, and I don't, that's not a threat to me. The stronger the women are is no threat to me. That just helps us to build a stronger world. I can be in this world with Africans who, are trans and that's not a threat to me to acknowledge that I, I just will never understand why that's a threat to people, you know, to acknowledge people's humanity. And as African people, I just simply will never understand with all the oppression we've experienced why so many of us are so, uh, so unwilling to acknowledge that. We should be, we are the best people, some of the best people anyway, to understand depression and the adverse impact it has on you and to recognize when people are experiencing that. And the way I interpret that is all my life, all of my adult life, since I was 17 years old, I've seen myself as an African, not an African-American, but an African in America fighting against American capitalism and imperialism. And when people call me black or African-American, it makes my skin crawl. So because that is not my identity, and I feel, especially when people know that that's not how I identify, and they still refer to me that way, I, can, I consider that an offense. I consider that disrespectful. So because I have that understanding, I can understand people who say, oh, I'm being misgendered or, you know, I'm not being acknowledged as a trans person. I never want anybody to feel how I feel when I'm being disrespected as an African. And it's, it's extremely difficult for me to understand why there are any African people that don't understand that. We lose nothing. I, I've lost nothing. You will never be able to explain to me what I've lost by establishing the very healthy position that I just articulated. So I think as men, we have to understand what true strength is because I can say without 
boasting and without being falsely modest that I, it's not a whole lot of people that have a, a, a whole lot more strength than I do in terms of dealing with things on an emotional level, dealing with adversity. And people always say, you're so strong. And I'm like, the reason why is because of what I've just spent the last few minutes talking about. Um, my role in this world is not based on besting anyone else. It's based on struggling with myself to be the best person that I can be, to be the most honest person that I can be. And whatever place I am in that, I'm not saying it's perfect, but whatever place I am in that, that's what people are seeing when they're telling me, oh, you're very strong. That's what you're seeing. So I, as men, I think that's what we have to struggle to achieve. And we can't do it on an individual level. We have to figure out how to do this on collective levels, to build communities where we redefine as Kwame Nkrumah talked about, that African woman, that African man, that African person, that revolutionary African personality, a rap as we call it. And this is all a part of that social revolution is redefining what types of human beings that we are. The strongest man is the one who stands up against patriarchy. I, to me, it takes no strength at all to deny patriarchy or diminish it or to be homophobic. That doesn't require any strength, that's a weak man that does that. A strong man is a man who acknowledges that oppression is universally wrong, not just wrong against you, but it's okay against other people. That's weak. That's a sad position to take in life. And I don't have any respect for people to take that position, just being honest. And they probably don't have any respect for me. And that's perfectly fine because I know that you cannot on a moral basis refute what I'm talking about right now. It, it's clearly a, a healthy and scientifically driven approach to how to live in this world. So we think that that's a critical thing that men need to develop. And then also, you know, as I said, we lose nothing by acknowledging systemic oppression against women identifying people. And again, I just don't understand why people feel like they're losing something. I think, I think what's actually happening there is men, for the most part, because of the dysfunctional way that we're socialized under a capitalist system, we have been dysfunctionally socialized to believe that power defined is us being able to occupy positions above people. And so when people rise up to stand up on their own integrity and to develop their own standing in the world and eliminate their oppression, because of this dysfunctional training, we are socialized to believe that we're losing something. And to me, this, is, this type of sickness is no different than these 70 million people who voted for this racist empire president. Um, both of them are empire presidents, but the one that's in office right now, it's no different than those people who feel like us standing up as oppressed Africans or indigenous people or Asians or whatever, um, who stand up against injustice means they're somehow losing anything. They're not losing anything. And if they had the courage and the fortitude, they would understand that they improve their lives as human beings by eliminating oppression. So I don't think that's any different with patriarchy and men. Like when we acknowledge that, we improve the quality of life for everybody. So we lose nothing. But when the most depressed sector advances, all of humanity advances. So if you really are for the advancement of humanity, there's no way you can be anything except anti-patriarchy, anti the systemic oppression of women identifying people, anti that oppression. You have to be like that. And we understand like the contradiction, you know, because it's a liberalist society. So we don't struggle uh, principally over issues like this. So we have this toxic environment today where it's okay to be patriarchal. Nobody even really challenges it. And so what happens in capitalism is that you have these background ideas and nobody really challenges them. And over time of this consistent dysfunction, these background ideas become normalized. And so it's no different than if you have a parent who from day one that you could speak told you that you're a worthless bum, you're never gonna be anything in life, even though that's, that's incorrect, after a while, there's no way some part of you is not gonna grow up believing that. And so by the same token, because patriarchy is normalized, there's no way after a while that we don't 
begin to believe that. So that's why from a systemic level, patriarchy is dominantly practiced by all men. Like I don't, I don't stand for Europeans coming to me saying I'm not racist. No, you're born in a racist capitalist system. So you have no choice but to be racist. Well, by the same token, as a man, there's no way I can stand and say, oh, I'm not patriarchal. I just told you I was raised by a very patriarchal man. So what you can do is dedicate your life to fighting relentlessly against patriarchy. So that's what we have to do, you all. That's what we have to do as men. If we're serious about humanity advancing, but if, if we're engaged in this because of our egos or are fulfilling some insecurity hole that we have, well, this is why we have dysfunction that we have today. And then I think as a part of our growth that we engage in as men collectively in the processes to challenge patriarchy that we've talked about and then we'll talk a little more about, um, as men, we have to call for the complete destruction of patriarchy on all systemic levels. And we have to and work to ensure this consciousness is being raised and implemented all the time, everywhere. And we cannot center ourselves in this work. We cannot center ourselves. We have to recognize, as I just said, that we benefit from patriarchy and we practice patriarchy and when we're called out on it, we can't center ourselves. We have to see ourselves as a work in progress. And that means we're gonna have to always be willing to do work and do this work to build up um, our, our struggle um, to eliminate these backward digressive systems of oppression against women identifying people in all of humanity. That's our role as men, as revolutionary men. But a lot of us, we use the word revolutionary, but we really don't know what it means. We think it just means shooting and killing the enemy. And that's a very, that's a part of it, being a revolutionary, but that's the easy part. That's a very small part. The most important and difficult part of being revolutionary are the things we're talking about right now. We cannot have revolution without revolutionaries. And we cannot have revolutionaries unless we are doing as Kwame and Krumah talked about, transforming ourselves as human beings. And transformation means that you have to be outside of your comfort level. And anytime I encounter a man, it's like, no, I just, I don't accept that. I'm paid, well, then you're not being, then you're not doing that. So don't call yourself revolutionary. I was talking to one of them, I'm, I'm this, I, I don't believe that. I'm like, well, you're not a revolutionary. I said, you're, you're a product of the enemy. That's what you are. I mean, you, you, your, your objective is to work to fulfill the interests of our enemies. That's what you're doing by talking about what you're talking about. So you have to be willing to put yourself in uncomfortable places. That's strength, you all. Anybody can be in comfortable places. Or as the, the old African proverb says, even a dead fish can go with the current. Anybody can do that. That's nothing. That's why I say you can't, you're not a hero because you're in the imperialist US military. You're, you're what you are as a working class mercenary when you do that. A hero are the ones who, or heroine are the ones who say, I'm not standing up for imperialism. That's what takes courage. That's where the strength comes in. Anybody can do what they're told. I wouldn't even brag about being in something where all I did was what somebody told me to do and I didn't even understand why I was doing it or what I was doing. Anybody can do that. I wouldn't even admit that if I was doing that. The real person to be respected is the person who says, no, that's wrong. I'm not gonna do that regardless of what consequences come to me as a result of it. So what we're saying is as men, we have to say patriarchy is wrong and we're gonna stand up and organize against it no matter what consequences come from. And I'm saying any men on here that I know that I'm friends with or have relationships with, if you don't like what I'm saying and you don't wanna be my friends, then the hell with you because we're trying to build a movement that advances humanity. And I got plenty of friends, I don't need friends that bad to compromise my principles. So that's what we believe we have to do as men. And then in terms of how we combat patriarchy, again, as always, it comes back to organized revolutionary political education. So whatever positive ideas I have, I got them through belonging to an organization, the organization you see there in the logo for decades, the All-African People's Revolutionary Party and its All-African Women's Revolutionary Union, as I mentioned, established in 1980, I credit the union 
with much of my development on this question of patriarchy. Um, when I uh, went through divorce, my daughter's on the line, so she can pipe in if I'm lying. Like, it was the union that stepped in to help facilitate that process so that we can maintain a humanistic relationship. Just because we weren't gonna be in a relationship together did not mean that we had permission to abandon our revolutionary African personality values of humanism, collectivism. We still, that's when you have to uphold those on an even higher level. Is it easy? Absolutely not. But did, it, did struggling to do that make me a stronger person? Absolutely. And I'm saying, if you're not willing to struggle with yourself to make yourself a stronger person, you're not serious. That's all. And we can just look at you and say you're not serious. They, that, that struggle is necessary to make us stronger, not just as individuals, but collectively. So that political education, that challenge, challenging all the backward ideas that we were raised with and challenging them and forcing ourselves to, in a collective struggle, to advance, that's exactly what we need, you all. That's exactly what we need. And then studying what organized women's groups are saying about patriarchal practices. Like it never ceases to amaze me. Most of the conversation on patriarchy is coming from men. Like, why would I listen to somebody like that Umar Johnson person, whoever, whatever? He's supposed to remember. Why would I listen to somebody like that on the question of patriarchy? You got to be out of your mind. When we've got organizations like the General Union of Guinea Bissau Women, UDMA, who have been around for 50 years and have extended articulated positions about patriarchy, organizations like the Pan African Women's Association, the All African Women's Revolutionary Union, that's who I go to to get an analysis on patriarchy. I talk to men all the time. They've not studied what any women's organizations have to say about patriarchy. I was just talking to a man the other day. I'm, I'm saying, tell me what he wants to talk to me about some random woman who wrote a pro-patriarchy, but a random individual that's not in an organization can say and do anything. I said, so that has no value to me. I want to talk about the organized women who have been fighting for women's emancipation. That person might have just wrote that book to make money. Who knows? I don't know. So I want to talk about the women's organizations that are committed to advancing women on a collective basis. Because the only way that's going to happen is through principal struggle and behavior. He had no, nothing. He had never studied any of those. So that's where we have to start going for information. If, if anybody came to you as an African, and said, well, here, here's a source that talks about white supremacy. And it was a white organization. You would, you would not listen to another thing that person had to say. Well, then that's the same about patriarchy and not studying the voices of these women, organization men, golden women, all of the African women's organizations who have positions on this, but that's where the organized political education comes from. You won't get that just by watching a YouTube video or having a conversation in a barber shop. I mean, we're, we're on a much more serious level than that here. We're trying to transform society. We can't do that based solely on barbershop conversations. We gotta get to work, you all. And so that's what we're talking about. And then, you know, there are other elements to that. Organized revolutionary community defense we talk about against patriarchy in neighborhoods. These are projects we can engage in to build anti-patriarchy uh, consciousness in neighborhoods, and we can certainly talk to you more about that, but that's definitely a, a, a strategy and a tactic to help bring about that consciousness. And then understanding again, our revolutionary African personality, this uh, misinformation that patriarchy is a part of African culture is, rampant today because we have not studied African culture. We haven't studied the history of Africa, the Judeo-Christian history, the Islamic history, the traditional African history. We have not seriously studied those, and we've certainly not done it from a nation, class, and gender analysis, uh, particularly a class analysis. We have not done that uh, on a whole as a people. And most of us listening don't even know what I mean when I say class analysis. So that's evidence right there that we have not engaged in that level of work the way we need to. So that's what's necessary 
We have other seminars and workshops here where we've talked extensively about class. We encourage you to look at those if that's you know something you need to do. But we're, what we're saying here is that we have to be willing to engage these concepts that way so that we can, again, have that struggle. Um, there is no progress without struggle. If you work out, you got to be uncomfortable. If you're in a relationship and you want that relationship to grow, you got to be uncomfortable. You cannot gain the type of consciousness we need against patriarchy if you're not willing to be uncomfortable, just like you can't do that with anything else. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Shakura to close us out. For anyone who is truly committed to the transformation of society from that of placing capital, also known as profits, over people, it is essential for peace and justice loving people to take firm positions against patriarchy on all levels. We must create an environment where anyone who claims to be against oppression must take an anti-patriarchal approach in their work. We would argue that most active organizers are exposed to the trauma of patriarchy. And since you are working regularly with women identifying people, and you have exposure to information that provides education, most of these people have some level of understanding about the need to eliminate this backward system of oppression. Most of these people recognize that patriarchy, capitalism, and white supremacy are inseparable as the tools to ensure we stay oppressed. Most of the time, the people who don't get this are the people who are not active in organizing work on a consistent basis. The people who do some reading on an individual basis and watch a lot of patriarchal videos. People that don't do much work with anyone outside of the circles they exist in that agree with their backward method of thinking. This is a reality that has to be broken up. We have to struggle to create an environment where principles, truth and justice supersede ego and insecurity. We have to build a movement based on anti-capitalism, anti-white supremacy, anti-patriarchy, and anti-homophobia, where being committed to these principles is the standard. This is the work that needs to take place. Find some women identifying organization, preferably a revolutionary one, like the All African Women's Revolutionary Union, General Union of Guinea-Bissau Women, Pan-African Women's Association, organization of Angola people, or all of them, and support them in any way that you can. Thank you. So we just want to close out by discussing, um, before we close out, just saying that, you know, we talk a lot about political education and community defense. And, you know, we're on a campaign to add this concept of revolutionary community defense to as an addendum to Kwame Nkrumah's Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. So as we've talked about, uh, the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare talks extensively about our the work on the ground to unite revolutionary Pan-African formations on the ground throughout Africa, fighting for one unified socialist Africa. So what we propose is that revolutionary community defense is a strategic approach for Africans living in the diaspora outside of the African continent to organize neighborhoods, to link up with the struggle for Pan-Africanism happening in Africa. And the way that that happens, and I actually have completed a manual or manifesto, if you will, that addresses how to build revolutionary community defense projects. And I'm in the process of dealing with capitalism right now to get it published. And it's it's revolutionary, it's pan-Africanist, it's radical. So, you know, oftentimes that's not a great formula for publication in the capitalist system. So uh, it will be published, it's, it, it's quality work. So it will be published, I can say that uh, with all modesty. So by the spring, it'll be out and it's gonna be called a guide for defense 
Against White Supremacists and Fascist Violence, a guide for defense against white supremacists and fascist violence. And so what that manifesto of about 150 pages will provide is a methodology to build this type of anti-patriarchal, anti-capitalist, anti-white supremacist, anti-homophobic uh, consciousness that we're taught we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes. And it will involve an organizing model where you go into communities and you begin to do this work. You establish mass organized political education on a mass level in neighborhoods. And you begin to do work to run this stuff out of there. Like for example, I have a zero po tolerance policy on domestic violence. Like if I see it, I'm interfering with that. I've gone to jail you all for doing that and will go to jail again. And I'm talking about seeing a man beating a woman identifying person and seeing that and stopping that from happening, physically stopping that. And the time I went to jail is because the guy tried to hit me with a stick and he ended up in the hospital for that. And I know some of you like, you know, because people are confused in capitalism. Well, that's violent. Um, you know, and I always tell people when it because people have said that to me in person when I've told this story. Well, that's violence is never the answer. And I'm like, so you're telling me that if you walked in on your children or your parents or your loved one, your partners, and someone was about to kill them, about to plunge a, a dagger into their heart, that you would just stand back and say, well, I'll leave it in the faith of the Lord or we shall overcome. That's all you would do is that. Like you wouldn't do anything necessary to help save your loved one's life, including picking up something and clonking the uh, perpetrator on the head so that your loved one could be saved. Now, a liar, a liar might say, yeah, I'll just sit back and sing we shall overcome. A liar, only a liar or a coward would say that. The overwhelming majority of us would do whatever we could to maintain safety for our loved ones. Is that violence? Of course, it is. that's absurd to suggest that. And what we're saying is that the masses of oppressed humanity have the same day-to-day -day urgency as the example I just gave. You might not see it because you don't have that ur urgency in your life, but the masses of oppressed humanity do. And so we don't see any difference there. And so, yeah, I'm not a shy. I'm proud of the fact <laughs> that I did what I did because what's important to me is that I live and be the person that I need to be to respect myself because that's what I need to do in order to, to live and function in a healthy way and give you the respect that you deserve if you deserve it. And I don't ever want to be that person that sees a man beating a woman identifying person and well, that's not my business. I don't want to be that person. If you're that person, then that's you. You're to me, to me, you're a coward, but that's I will never be that person. I don't care if I'm 80 years old, I will do whatever I can do. And so the purpose of this revolutionary community defense is not to do something like that on an individual level, but to organize and train women identifying people to create patriarchy-free zones in neighborhoods where they're trained from a conflict de-escalation standpoint, from a self-defense standpoint, from a revolutionary standpoint to address those issues. So, you know, we can't go into deep, deep detail here, but that manifesto manual will be out and we are working to continue to lay the groundwork in many different places to establish these types of projects. And, you know, within a two or three year period, we'll have a number more of them up and running. And, and that's what we think is essential towards ensuring that patriarchy, the consciousness against patriarchy grows and the absolute work to protect women identifying people grows with that work being held by women identifying people. You know, the times when I've done that where we've been able to help organize women identifying folks and we made a list of all the abusers in their community. They always know who they are. Um, we made a list of them and we went to these people, these dudes, and we talked about, we strategized, we planned. Everything is organization, as Kwame Ture said, decides everything. We planned it out. What'll happen? What are the scenarios? What if they do this? 
who will do that? Who will do this? We plan everything out. Everybody knew their role. And we showed up and we told these people, you've been abusive. There was one case that I'll never forget. This, this dude was, what he was doing is robbing elderly women in the community, stealing whatever little they had. And oftentimes uh, the accusation was that he was raping them as well. So we told them like, this is what you've done. Oh, I haven't done that. Or like, look, we're not here to have a debate. This is about, and it's not me talking. It's the women identifying people talking. I'm just there to survive, provide support, me and other people there, the other organizers there. And we're telling, they're telling this fool, we have resources we've organized. Well, he, cause he was like, I, I have drug dependency problems and I go out and I do this stuff so I can get money for drugs. Okay, well, we have, we've lined up free drug and alcohol counseling for you. We've lined up free rides to get you there and back. All you have to do is do it. We've lined up uh, uh, programs to help you find work once you do that work. And all you have to do is do it. So with some of these guys, they were like, yeah, I want to do it because they could tell we were serious. And they did. A lot of them did, again, transformation. They were able to become better people. Some of them said, no, I ain't doing that. And he said, OK, well, then you got 24 hours to get out of this neighborhood. Well, what if I don't? Well, you'll see in 24 hours, I guess. You know, we'll just have to wait and see what happens, right? Like, we're not going to say over the airwaves what's going to happen, but um, it's really not going to be a probably a pleasurable experience experience because you're preying off of our people in our communities. And if we organize ourselves, we can address these types of problems that evolve from patriarchy. So that's what we have to do is begin to, to do that so that we can begin to organize that type of uh, existence. So, you know, that's what we talked about with, uh, I don't know what's going on here with the screen. There's always something here. But that's what we talked about with um, that type of, of work is finding a way to engage that and help build that capacity on a mass level. So that's what we're talking about when we say that. And I apologize for this, but you know, capitalism is what it is. Um, so yeah, so this is what we mean when we say, revolutionary community defense. And we believe that it's a very, uh, it will be a very effective tool in helping dismantle patriarchal oppression. So just to recap, you know, we've talked about what we think men need to do. And as always, you know, we've talked about that. We've also talked about how we can organize against it on a systemic level. We've certainly given much praise and respect to the All African Women's Revolutionary Union who deserve so much of that and more. And we continue to do that. And just to make no mistake about it, what we want to build is cultures and environments where patriarchy is unacceptable. It's unacceptable to engage in patriarchal behavior. It's unacceptable to express patriarchal views. We want all of that to be the reality. That's what we're working for. And so, we encourage people because we know that's a collective effort. That's the only way that will happen. So we encourage you, if you're not in an organization, join an organization working for the people. Join an organization working for the people. You know, we constantly say that, and I understand people don't understand what we mean because most of us are not in organizations. So how could you understand? And until we begin to understand that only the masses of people make history and no one is going to free you except yourself being involved, then we'll never move past the point that we're at now. You know, I don't know the sincerity level of these Africans forming these militias, this not effing around coalition. I, I don't know. You know, I, I, I have deep concerns about anybody with guns when there's no organized political education. History is full of examples, including the Black Panther battles with the US organization, all, you know, we can go back in Katha in, a, in a Zania, South Africa in the 80s. Um, history is full of examples of paramilitary groups with no political education, and that has never worked out well. So I have deep concerns about that, which I've written about and expressed many times. But what I can say about that is, um, 
even if you think that that's great, you know, this performance art of having guns, we're not, no, no Klansmen have been shot that I know of. So that's why I call it performance art, because if, if we're taking guns to the Klan, we need to be eliminating the Klan. And that, that can only happen by us being organized. And 1,000, 1,500 of us with guns, when millions of us are not involved in our struggle for justice, that's not organization, you all. Organization is millions of us involved in our struggle for justice. Millions of us on the same page to fight for our liberation. And if we had that, the, the, the African that leads that group that was arrested, that, that, that kind of thing can never happen. So even those of you that argue in favor of that, you want to argue me down, upwards and downwards about that, you cannot refute the foundation of what I'm saying. If we were organized, the, the reason why the police can go in so easily and arrest him and any one of us that they want is because we're disorganized. So that proves that all the 1,500 guns, they didn't do anything to stop him from being arrested, did they? And that's because we're not organized, you all. So th there's no logical argument against organization. There is not one. So instead of continuing to waste time trying to figure one out, let's just start getting organized. That's all we ask, just a little organization, just to start. So we encourage you, if you want to join the All African People's Revolutionary Party, and if you're women identifying, when you join the All African People's Revolutionary Party, you're automatically a member of the All African Women's Revolutionary Union, and we need to bolster and support our union. So we encourage you to join us. And the information you see there on the screen at the bottom is how you do that. You can go to aprp-intl.org. And a number of you are, have done that. And we very much appreciate that. Um, we're trying to organize our people. So please make that commitment to talk to us about that. And, and we'll talk to you about it. And if you decide after you understand more about what we're about, you don't want to do it, I promise you we won't stalk you. But we will tell you, you have to belong to some organization working for our people. If it's not ours, it has to be some organization. So go to that site, aprp-intl.org, and sign up to join the APRP. Um, there's also much uh, written on that site about the revolutionary, the struggle for revolutionary pan-Africanism around the world. Um, information you're not going to get just anywhere. So please support. Make a donation there. Support independent revolutionary African organization. Make a donation. And then Ajamu Umi's Truth Challenge, www.abetterworld.me. Um, that's my personal site. You can connect to the APRP site there if you want to reach out to me. If you want to do like a lot of people, reach out and cuss me out. That's fine. Um, I probably won't answer if you do that because I have better things to do. You apparently don't. <laughs> Those of you that do that. So, um, but if you want to, you know, say, hey, I need help. Maybe you're not African, for example, but you want to organize and you can't join the APRP. Or maybe you want to join the APRP. You just want to talk more about how to do that. So reach out to me there. If you're not African, you want to do some of this organizing work, reach out. We'll share our template. We'll share our models with you. Um, we will continue to do that. And then the last site, hoodcommunist.org. That's a collection of African revolutionaries that write there regularly. I'm proudly and humbly one of them. Um, so please check that out. Um, there are a number of really wonderful African revolutionaries from various organizations, All African People's Revolutionary Party, Black Alliance for Peace, um, Black Hammer that write for Hood Communists. So you should support these independent revolutionary African venues. Uh, if you don't do, if you're not coming to these places, I don't know where you're getting information about us because you're not going to get it from CNN and CIA. I know you, everybody knows that. And finally, join us next week and spread the word. We're going to be talking about the question of land. What does that mean when we talk about land? What is that? What are we talking about? Are we talking about whoever's on the land has to be moved off? Maybe. We'll know. We're going to talk about that next week. When we say Africa is our home, what are we talking about? When we say America belongs to the indigenous people, what are we talking about? America is the indigenous land, Africa for the Africans. What does that mean? So that's what we're going to be talking about next week. So join us December 13th, 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We really appreciate you all spending your Sunday with us. 
Um, we had a good number of people watching us today. We appreciate you all. We love you all. Please spread the word. Um, organization is the weapon of the oppressed. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Forward ever, backwards never. Organize for change, revolutionary change. And we look forward to seeing you soon.